الله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ونعم محمد وعلى آل سيد على سيدنا نعم محمد وبارك فيه وسلم عليه صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله We've been talking about Sayyidina Imam Hussain al-Islam for the last couple of weeks, and we'll continue. And last week, when I was talking, you know, time sort of ended, uh, as it does always, uh, or rather time continues, it's just the time for the topic ended. Um, and I mentioned uh, two things, which I really didn't expound on. One is that the greater the status, the greater the responsibility. Now, you don't expect the same from a first year medical student as you do from someone who's been a doctor for 20 years. It's just the way things work. Uh, and so when we look at the status of Imam Hussain al -Islam, He is the beloved grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He is Sayyid al-Shabab al-Ahl al-Jannah. He is the leader of the youth of Jannah. He is the one for whom Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that whoever that Allah loves whoever loves him. And you know the list goes on and on. So when he's given this position, this status, then the expectation is that he's gonna do something great. You know, somebody's given a position and they never do anything related to that position, then you wonder why were they given the position. And this is the, not the way of Allah. The other thing, however, is that I mentioned, and we're going to come back to this point as well, but I mentioned another point, which was that, you know, when we, if you look at history, and if we look at the history during the time of the companions of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu everything is different. Because if any issue comes up, everyone knows where to go. And if someone doesn't accept his decision on anything, then it becomes very obvious that this is a kafir or a mushrik, I mean, or a uh, munafiq, you know, a hypocrite or a disbeliever. Which, you know, you can't be... You can be kafir without being monophic, but you can't be monophic without being kafir. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we look at the history during the time of the Rasulullah, so when everything's a little different. But then when we look at the time of the companions, you know, so that starts, you know, 10th year of Hijrah. Actually, the beginning of the 11th year of Hijri, when the Rasulullah so some passes, until the last companion passes, 106 Hijri. You know, we mentioned him, uh, Abu Tafal Ahmad ibn Wafila, radiallahu anhu. So, when we look at this time, you know, if we look at Islam. We see that Islam was spread through the efforts of the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, you look at, you know, Iraq, uh, Persia, 
you know, Saad bin Abi Waqas is sent in that area. We look at Rome or the Byzantines, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah is sent over there. You know, we look at various other areas, you know, Egypt, Amr bin Al-As, sent with the companions there. So we see this. Sit down. So we see this, and but if we look at the protection of the religion itself, you know, one is to spread Islam. But I am no talking. When we look at the protection of Islam, the protection of Islam is done exclusively by Ahlul Bayt. You know, as far as the protection of the concepts of the religion, the protection of the understanding of the religion. Even during the time of the Khulfa Rashidin, whenever an issue came up, who did they turn to? Sayyidina Ali Karam Allah you know, There were 14 companions whom the Rasulullah personally gave permission to give rulings. And if we look at that list and we look at their attitudes towards Sayyidina Ali Karam Allah he's also in that list. If any issue came up that they didn't know how to deal with, they would always turn to him. And Abu Darda, radiallahu who was one of those amongst that list, and he was the faqih in Sham, while Abdullah ibn Masood, radiallahu was in Kufa. And so Abu Darda, radiallahu he has a statement where he says that, you know, the world of Islam has three scholars, meaning three faqi, main faqi. The man in Sham, the man in Kufa, and the man in Medina Munawwar. And if the man in Sham has any issues, he turns to the man in Kufa, meaning Abdullah ibn Masood. So Abu Dawud al-Rabani says, if I have any problems, I ask him. And if the man in Kufa has any issues, then he turns to the man in Medina Munawwar, who is Sayyidina Ali Karam Allah And then he says, he says, and he doesn't need to ask anyone else. You know, he is the door to the city of knowledge. So all of that knowledge came through that door. And uh, Rasulullah says, so when he mentions this, he says that if you want the knowledge, then come to the door. And so Imam Hussein al-Islam grew up in this environment. He literally grew up in the lap of Rasulullah sallallahu So again, we would expect great things from him. And of course, he doesn't disappoint. Today, of course, is the 10th of Muharram. So this was the day in the year 61 Hijri. So two months short of 50 years from the passing of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Still another 45 years before the final companion passes. And of course, you know, this is the time of Hijrah, so the time of Jummah, and this is the time when he starts to send out the family. And if you look at those who left with him from Kufa, you have 72, of which roughly about 25 were from the household of Rasulullah Sallallahu the remaining 50 were friends. 
disciples, students. On the evening of the ninth, you know, the army of Yazid wanted to attack. And this is when Imam Hussein al-Islam, he goes to them, he says, look, you know, tonight is the night of the 10th. You know, because the night of the 10th of Muharram has been an auspicious night from the beginning of time. So many things happened on the 10th. And so, he goes to them and he says, look, it's late, you know, this is a blessed night, so at least allow us to pray and worship Allah during this night. That was the only request of his that they accepted. All the other things that he had requested from them, they denied. So the only one that they accepted, say fine, you know, tomorrow we got the whole day. There's another reason for why they didn't attack that night. Because if you remember, amongst the army of Yazid, you have 500 fuqaha, 500 scholars of fuqaha. Hundreds, if not thousands, of hufaz. So they also wanted to worship that night. Of course, their worship has no meaning. You know, the heart, you know, there's a narration or a hadith in Mustadrak, Imam Hakim's Mustadrak, in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he talks about a man who was fasting by the day, worshiping Allah all night. He is in front of the Kaaba, he is in the position of sajda, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes his soul and he goes directly to hell. because he has in his heart the animosity of Ahlul Bayt. You know, from the outside, we look at him and say, ah, oh, what a blessed death. Now, so there are, you know, he died in Sajda in front of the Kaaba, in Salat. And yet none of that did him any good because of his attitude toward Ahlul Bayt. And so the next morning, you know, we look at Imam Hussein al-Islam and, and his attitude and his connection to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And his attitude is the attitude of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa His character is the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And so he, you know, there was an opportunity that morning for some of his men to kill a few of the generals of the army of Yazid. And when his men asked him permission, you know, this is before the fighting officially starts, they asked him permission and he said no, because I don't want it to be said that I am the one who started this. You know, in the Battle of Badr, before the battle began, Rasulullah <coughs> took control of all of the wells, the water wells in Badr. And before the fighting starts, Quraysh came and asked permission for some water. And he gave it to them. And yet we see in Karbala that they have had no water the water has been cut off, even though the Euphrates is, you know, just not even a hundred yards away. The water has been cut off. Of course, the provisions ended, you know, you're traveling to a place and, you know, when you're traveling, you have limited provisions. When they end, you have to replenish them.
And so, and this is the condition that they're in that morning. They've been out of food for three days. They've been out of water for three days. And so, in the beginning, again, those to, uh, to his friends who had come with him, they go out as a group and fight as a group. And of course, what are 50 people going to do? And actually, it was a little bit more because, he had, as we mentioned before, some people that joined, some people that snuck in from Kufa. And even if there were 100, which there weren't, what are they going to do against 22,000? But disbelief understands the power of faith. This is why they sent 22,000. You know, and 22,000 is kind of a moderate estimate. You have some people that say, no, 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 there's only 5,000 or 10,000, which you know, those are like in the great minority. Some people that say that there were 30,000. Most accounts, roughly about 22,000, when you start adding up, you know, various armies that came. The first army that was sent was at least a thousand. Then you had other parts of the army coming. So when these friends are gone, this is, you know, again, Imam Hussein, as we mentioned, he keeps going back to them. For the past eight days, from the 2nd of, of uh, Muharram until now, he's been telling them who he is. He's been telling, he's been giving them options to get out of this. He says, why do you want my blood on your hands? He says, I am the grandson of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi there is no other grandson of Rasulullah Sallallahu remaining. He says, we are the ones in whose house the Qur'an was revealed. Just the weight of that statement, that we are the ones in whose house the Qur'an was revealed. Everybody, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, we love the Qur'an, the Qur'an, the Qur'an. But what about the ones in whose house the Qur'an was revealed? Everything falls on deaf ears. But then he goes up again, when only the family is remaining. And he addresses them again, and now he says, he again addresses them, and he tells them. He says, look, everything can be forgiven. But just change your way. And so, this time when he goes, he says, he says, is there anyone? who will help the family of Rasulullah in their hour of need. And this is when Hur, who was the first general sent against him, along with two of his sons and about three other people, come over to his side, ask for his forgiveness, and then they fight. But once they're gone, you know, because he had made, Imam Hussein Islam had made Fajr, in the tents with his people. And then he makes Zohar as Salat al Khawf. And so at the time of Zohar is now when he starts sending out the family. His half brothers, the sons of Ali, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Abdullah, Muhammad, Jafar. And Allah is already pleased with them all. So they go out 
one by one. Abbas stays back because he's the flag bearer. And one by one, they are martyred. And it's interesting when you read the history, and the history here is stuff that's documented you know, through the narrations of Imam Zain al Abidi, who is the only male survivor of Karabala. Bibi Zainab and Umar Kuthum, who are the sisters of Imam Hussain al Islam, the daughters of Bibi Fatima al Salam al And the accounts of the ones who perpetrated the act. And so every one time one of them falls, he goes, he rides out, he brings them back, and he lays them next to the tents. Then eventually his cousins, the sons of Aqil, the brother of Ali, and then his nephews, four of the sons of Imam Hassan, alayhi you know, each one when they go out, they're by themselves. And they challenge the enemy and you get a one-on-one -on -one duel which they basically kind of annihilate the, the enemy. And then when the enemy sees this, of course, you know, you get this whole gang mentality. You know, which is an interesting point, again. Disbelief understands the power of Islam. This is why even today, you know, when we are left with simply a shell, you know, we know what's inside, yeah. but they still fear us to the extent that when they come against us, they never come alone. They always form a coalition. And this has been throughout history, and even today. But he rides out, he, he picks them up, brings them back, lays them by the tent. His nephews, his brothers, and then eventually his son, Ali Akbar. Again, he rides out and he's also martyred. But before he's martyred, he's fighting and they can't control him. You know, this is the blood of Ali the conqueror of Khaybar. They have no response to his attack. At one point he rides back to his father and he says that if I had simply a drop of water, I would plow through all of them. And again, they haven't drank anything for three days. It's the desert. And of course, some people try to say, oh, no, no, it was winter. Well, it was October. It's still the desert. It's still dry. The nights may be cool, but the days are still hot. And so, When he, he rides back and he says this to his father, his father says simply, suck on my tongue, maybe you'll get something. And when he tries to suck on his tongue, he says, your tongue is more dry than mine is. He rides back out, you know, and he's in his early 20s. Eventually he's martyred. Imam Hussein Islam brings him back lays him beside the tent. Eventually, after there is no one left, Abbas is also martyred. The flag bearer, the brother of, of Imam Hussein al-Islam, he's also martyred. And so eventually, you know, there's no one left except him and his six-month-old son, Ali Aswar. So his wife says to him, he says, you know, he's thirsty, maybe they'll have, uh, you know, some sympathy on him. He's six months old. 
So he walks out with him in his hands, and he says, you know, your fight is with me. What do you have with this child? And as he's talking to them, they shoot the arrow through his neck, through the neck of Adiyaska. As the blood, you know, comes down on the face and the beard of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When Allah subhanahu wa takes away guidance from someone, then the reality, as Allah subhanahu wa mentions in Surah uh, theme, you know, he says, the lowest of the low, you know, worse than animals. And again, all of their recitation of the Qur'an, their memorization of the Qur'an, their understand, or their knowledge, not the understanding, but the knowledge of the fiqh, being able to verbalize all of these rules and regulations, none of that enter their hearts. Because for any of that to enter the heart, the love of Ahlul Bayt has to be there first. Because that is what wipes away or cleanses the heart so that this other stuff enters and there is an understanding of this. You know, this is the condition of the Ummah today. We have forgotten our foundation. You know, and what I'm mentioning isn't you know, from some book of the Shia. These are, and not through the books of history even. This is through the books of the Hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and this is through the Quran. Time's up, I'll stop here. Uh, we have our program tomorrow, inshallah, we'll continue. Uh, and also continue next Friday as well, inshallah. You know, may Allah SWT grant us that true love of Ahlul Bayt. You know, give us his own love and the love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa If that love is true, then the love of Ahlul Bayt automatically comes with that. You know, it's a package deal. So may he grant us that, you know, so that, that in the hereafter, we are not amongst those that Ridwan, the guardian of the gate of, of paradise, when he checks our paperwork to enter paradise, he says, oh, you're missing something, and kicks us out. And that gets into the narration of Bibi Aisha Siddiq, which we don't have time for right now. Uh, but may Allah SWT grant us this, and when the brother's going to give the first adhan, then we make sunnah, and then we uh, continue as usual, inshallah. as Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar.